I'll show you the Berners Lee footage. It's a. Uh, um, I have to tell you that I'm a giant fan of yours. Oh really? Yes, I am. I. Uh, I mean, I I don't know you and I've never met you, but I it seems to me as though, I, I maybe maybe I'm just it's just the Larry Smart image rather than. Uh, than the real Larry Smar, but you have to tell me what that is. <laughs> um, I'm the one person see that never gets to see that. The Larry Smar image? Yeah, right. Oh, There's trouble when you're inside it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know you're an astronomer. Oh yeah. You know Bob true. Stein by any chance? Sure. Yeah, Bob Stein is my mentor. Really? Oh yeah, we did gave Bob lots of time. Yeah, I heard he's like in top five here. Um, yeah. Bob is Bob is the guy that taught me high performance computing. I go way back with him. And uh, Rob Wolf used to be a good friend of ours before he had his stroke or heart yeah. attack or whatever it was. And uh, but I mean, it, to me, it after so we don't get disrupted. Why don't you take this and put it over there? Tell Terry to hold my calls. And let's see, let's see. As to why an astronomer got into this? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, okay. Tell, tell me how does NCSA start? I mean, the, the whole purpose of this mm -hmm. is. is it's sort of about NCSA. It's not mm -hmm. as much about Netscape and Mosaic. I mean, it, to me, I'm curious as a high performance yep. computing guy about how, why it happened here. Right. Which is, I think, yeah, I can talk about that. Question. Okay. Yep. So go ahead. Tell me about NCSA. Okay. Um, does a little red light go on when you're? Yep, I'm recording. Okay, good. Um, well, I am a trained relativistic astrophysicist, and I. Got my PhDs, always in physics departments, working on astrophysics problems involving general relativity, gas dynamics, and so forth. And so in the 70s, when I was developing what is now called numerical general relativity, which is the way to solve Einstein's equations for dynamics of black holes, colliding black holes, or in astrophysics uh, that require general relativity, like supernova events and so on, uh, I had uh, to go and get a top secret nuclear weapons clearance to get access to supercomputers because in the mid 70s uh, the only place to get a supercomputer was uh, either at Livermore, Los Alamos or uh, in one area which was weather. Now astronomy has always been a driver of supercomputing and in fact uh, on Johnny von Neumann's computer that was built um, by the Institute uh, half of that and went to Army uh, to Aberdeen. Half of that was used, of course, for the Army for uh, trajectory uh, calculations, but the other half was used for stellar evolution. So astronomy and von Neumann's interest in weather meant that astronomy and weather for 50 years basically have been uh, dominant drivers of supercomputing usage. And yet, uh, to do pure astrophysics, you're having to get a top secret nuclear weapons clearance. Now, nobody seemed to think there was anything unusual about this. Um, and so I just went ahead as a postdoc and I would get a few months in the summer, work 100 hours a week, and then the rest of the year I'd have to live off that. I'd go back to Harvard where I was a junior fellow, try to explain to them about, you know, one could solve the laws of physics that we had been laying down for 300 years in incredible detail for engineering devices like nuclear weapons that put on Earth temperatures of the center of the sun, uh, stresses beyond anything that we could imagine in academic problems that we were trying to solve in lots of disciplines. So this thing could revolutionize academic research. Well, nobody got it. I mean, it was like, I really felt like I was transitioning in a flying saucer between this advanced civilization at Livermore and this Stone Age culture at Harvard. And Harvard was as advanced as any place in thinking about this. So it was a, what I did not figure this out until it was in the early 80s and by then the first Cray had gone into the continent of Europe in an open scientific institute, the Max Planck Institute for Physics and Astrophysics. So I'm over there in the summer along with people like Dave Arnett who is one of the great supernova super, uh, supercomputer guys in our country and people in chemistry and it was like Paris in the 20s with all these expatriates sitting over there and and we're like trying to figure this out like this is an American built supercomputer right? Why are we in Munich? Right? I mean, this is very strange. So, <clears throat> but you know, in America, we don't question the infrastructure somehow. I mean, it's just like it's either there or it isn't there, and that's just the way it is. But I was uh, having a Moss of Beer late one night. Actually, I think it was the second Moss of Beer with my German host, who had also been born like I was post war. 
And he finally turns to me and he says, aren't you ashamed of yourself? You big, rich, occupying country. You come over here in our little country and, and we finally get enough money scraped together after World War II to buy one of these supercomputers and you Americans come over here and use up our time. He says, how did you guys ever win the war? You know, what, what is going on here? And, I, and so this finally sort of just stimulated me to saying, what is going on here? This is nuts. And I went back and I found out, for instance, that after the Sputnik program, the federal government had funded the universities, built the science buildings, started the supercomputer centers, IBM would go around and give away almost the mainframes, and, and so the scientists in the 60s took it for granted that they had the fastest computers in the world in academia. But about 1970, with the starting of the Vietnam War and with all kinds of guns and butters issues and everything else, that stopped. And in fact, to give you an example, by 78, half the number of PhDs in engineers in engineering was being generated in our country as there were in 1970. So there was this complete severing of the Sputnik era uh, partnership with the federal government and it was particularly bad in computing. To give you an example, when I was at Livermore in, um, in the 70s there were four CDC 7600s which were just one of the finest supercomputers ever built. No American university ever took delivery of a single CDC 7600. In fact, the University of Illinois, when I first got here, had a Cyber 175, which was a retread, a second design manufacturing of, of this thing. And we were one of the first universities that had it, and people all thought that, you know, Illinois naturally was way ahead of everybody else. So it's like we were just completely divorced from the private sector that was generating these wonderful machines because of federal policy which was to say these things are only are so valuable that we can only afford to put them into war environments so after this german encounter i um, came back and i said well gee i wonder how many other scientists like me are there so at the university of illinois i started call it cold calling my colleagues and saying Hi, you don't know me, I'm a little assistant professor, but I bet you that your research is blocked by lack of access to supercomputers. Uh, and they'd sort of say like, huh, crack, crack, who is this, you know, <laughs> crank call. And, but we'd start talking in chemistry and biology and agriculture and so on. And, and sure enough, it turns out that, that that was true. They knew how to do the science, they just didn't have access. So I said, well, send me a little, perspectives of what science you could do if you had a supercomputer. Well, I ended up with 65 faculty and 15 departments on one campus. And I thought, this has got to be this way all over the country. So it was, I really started saying, well, gee, somebody's got to raise this issue. And about that time, there had been a lax report that had uh, the federal government had done to begin to undercover some of this stuff, but they still weren't. I remember Peter Lax, he was one of the greatest mathematicians, uh, head of the, one of the top people in the Cron Institute, a long time advocate of things computational. And I had this long, long battle with Peter because in the draft report of the Lax report, it was not, it was going to say, well, yeah, we got to get one of these supercomputers and make it available to the universities, but you know, let's put it at Livermore, put it somewhere that people know how to do this stuff. And a university was not on the list of what the LAX report considered to be appropriate sites for a supercomputer. So I had this long battle over the telephone, I remember with Peter LAX, it was sort of David and Goliath, because I mean, he was this giant of the field, I'm nobody. And um, I, I finally convinced him not to exclude universities as a possibility even though he felt that it was fairly unlikely that any of them would be able to play with sharp instruments and not hurt themselves. Um, so I mean you gotta understand the world was totally different when the supercomputer centers program was coming into being and people it's so hard for people now on the web and everything to go back to that time. There was no internet you know, there was, there was these wonderful people, Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn and all these people, Bill Joy, who had developed TCP IP and, 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 and embodied it in the ARPANET. This was a few computer science departments and military, okay? Nobody in a physics department or chemistry department ever heard of the ARPANET, much less had any access to it. Uh, but it was obviously the right idea. 
And so once we got the Congress to put through money for a national supercomputer program, then there was a national competition and, and, and so on, and the five centers were selected. The first thing then the NSF realized, well, okay, now we put these in place to be providing access to academic scientists, and yet, uh, like, they have to fly to Champaign-Urbana, like I had to fly to Livermore, okay? This isn't right. So there were a lot of discussions then, but the trouble was that the telecom lobbyist in Washington would block any discussion of the federal government putting in the kind of network we have today, which is what people wanted. I mean, everybody knew that they wanted to have a ubiquitous email, person-to-person -person network. But as soon as they'd start talking about that, the telecom lobbyists would come up and say, no way, guys, that's private sector. Don't get the federal government involved in that. Stay out of it. <clears throat> so what we learned early on is real interesting. It's like if we had argued instead of the supercomputer program, let's get the federal government to buy everybody a personal computer which was IBM personal computer was two years old in 1985 and put on people's desk, okay? Again, this would be an interference with the private sector. Um, so, but we said, oh, we'll just take a few of these esoteric supercomputers and they said, okay, that's right. There's no market there, that's okay. The federal government has a role. Well, it was the same thing with networking. What we said is, we just wanna put a high speed backbone across the country to connect the five centers and, and the telecom people said, okay, that's cool. You know, 56 kilobits was the national high-speed backbone, less than ISDN today. Um, yeah, that's not a market, okay? And, and we said, we got a few of these weird supercomputer types who are out in universities who want to hook into that. And they said, yeah, that's okay. That's not a market. You can do that. Well, that was the NSF net backbone. Then the regionals got funded. And then the campuses were afraid that if they didn't, dig up their quad and put in some fiber, then the professors who wanted to get access to supercomputers would go to a university that would do that. So gradually the whole internet emerged out of uh, the, the, the sort of policy vice you get into Washington where you can't do the right thing. You have to do something that seems irrelevant, but has a logic to it that will gradually bring the market forces into play that will spin out ultimately a whole industry. With that as background, I think you can understand that where some of the software development that NCSA is associated with came, with, came from. Uh, in a way, you could argue that this TCP IP linkage between these five centers that were all within security walls was the world's first intranet. Okay, 12 years before you ever heard the word. Well, it was the same way with client server. We knew from the beginning that the personal computer was the real computer. That was the computer that was gonna change the world. But, you know, we're starting the Sinners program two years after the IBM PC came out. Remember, we're, we're, maybe the XT <laughs> was available at that time. The Mac was light years ahead of, of DOS on, you know, four color, black, white, magenta, and cyan. Um, and, and so we did a lot of work with the Mac, but also uh, even DOS. So the first thing was clear is um, Unix wizards knew how to do telnet and remote login to bring remote computers up on your screen. But ordinary folks with Macs and DOS didn't have a clue, so that's why we developed NCSA Telnet, which was software that allowed you to have multiple computer, remote computers open on your screen and doing remote sessions in them, uh, which is how you had to behave if you were going to be in a networked world. Well, of course, that was client server. And now, of course, that is the basis of the whole corporate uh, IT industry. But back then, it just seemed like the logical next step to us as we moved to a network world. Um, we had this, we'd make these pictures of the Macintosh screen with a little cray icon on the Mac and then the title would be Hide the Cray. Now this was totally radical. Why? Because we were taking the supercomputer and the mass storage systems out of Livermore and Los Alamos and essentially just literally cloning them. I mean, we were using the Cray time sharing system. We were using the mass store software they used. It was literally just cloned it. But at Livermore and Los Alamos at that time, you did the word processing 
and you're editing on the Cray from a dumb terminal. There was no notion that you use the personal computer. There was no client server. There was just time sharing. So it was, cons it was very radical, actually. And, and I think the other radical thing was distribution. You know, we could have taken Telnet and tried to keep the intellectual property or do whatever, you know, tie it up. But instead we said, if we're just going to get anywhere, let's just give it to everybody. Now this was considered, again, kind of radical. Um, turned out that, that later on the authors of, one of the authors, Gage Paulson, uh, went out and started up a company, Intercon, which was later bought and it was a successful private sector company. But we didn't let that interfere with our primary mission, which was to get out software to enable people to be better able to use high performance computing than they would have otherwise. We invented the notion of, well, I don't know if we invented it, but we adopted the notion of putting up the um, software on anonymous FTP servers and letting people download it and the rapid prototyping that the world now thinks um, is the way to go. I mean, that was being done 12 years ago with Telnet. Uh, every time we'd come up with a new rev, we'd just put it up on the anonymous server. You want it, you'd take it down. If NCSA had decided, let's make a distribution unit in a warehouse and let's hire lots of secretaries to take people's names and numbers and let's charge for it, um, the internet would have been much more slow in coming because you know, many people, large fraction, probably the people that first got on the internet, did so using NCSA Telnet. Notice that it was DOS and Mac users that required it. So what this did is, I think without NCSA Telnet, the internet would have stuck much more closely to its ARPANET roots. Namely, it would have been a Unix environment with a more wizardy kind of approach. What we did was broaden out the user base to include personal computer users at the beginning of the takeoff of the internet um, or its handoff from ARPANET. And that I think had a lot to do with the culture of today's internet which is that it's a broad-based um, non-elite um, network. ARPANET was an ex extremely elite network um, with uh, wonderful people, uh, great visionaries that were involved in it, but it was very elite. It wasn't even the academic community, research community, much less any, everybody with a PC. So now Telnet essentially is client server, right? Um, NCSA image, which we did in the late 80s as we helped develop scientific visualization, developed a lot of the things that led to the day's special effects. In 87, uh, the head of my uh, computer graphics labs was Stefan Fangemeyer. I uh, did the first thunderstorm scientific visualization. Uh, well, Stefan was in charge of all special effects for Twister. Stefan is the person who Newsweek said when Jurassic Park came, first came out, Stefan was the person who brought the dinosaurs to life and gave them attitude. Now, attitude was something that Stefan had. and. Uh, I think that whole era is one that most people don't realize. Again, NCSA had a very um, pivotal, seminal role in. But what we basically did during that late 80s period was to make the world safe for images. What NCSA Image did was basically we said we want to build a world of infrastructure in which it's as easy to move an image around as it is to move a word. That was our design parameters. Back, and, and that's the way we talked about it back then. So that meant we had to scale the network, scale the disk drives, scale the compute power. We had to go to full color. When the Mac 2 first came out, 256 color levels, uh, we got 50 of them. Apple gave us 50 Mac 2s, which was like stunning uh, in those days. We were in fact were the largest funded um, group in the academic group in the country for the Apple Advanced Technology Group. IBM at that time was telling their customers you don't need color. We've already provided it as I said. You have four of them. Black, white, cyan, and magenta. Why would you need more? So what we did was we took things that were on $100,000 
computer graphics workstations of image processing that medical imaging people use, satellite reconnaissance people use. And we took all that, put it into software and NCSA image on the Mac. And so you could just move the mouse and do what it would take you, what would have otherwise cost you $100,000 to do. And you'd have to be an elite specialist. But again, taking things that elite people knew how to do, could afford to do, and making it available to the masses. So by the early 90s, the next level really was collaboration software. Again, something that the private sector is now beginning to do. Uh, NCSA Collage was, again, a cross-platform Mac, DOS, Unix, uh, synchronous collaboration environment in which you could have common whiteboards, color images. And a lot of what Collage has still isn't in the private sector offerings. And that was like 1990, 91. In fact, I remember we had uh, a meeting in San Diego with a lot of the top government people. And we uh, did a live demo that most people that were in the room will never forget. We had people at Cornell, at Pittsburgh, at NCSA, and at San Diego all on a collage synchronous uh, link up from their workstations and then we had a telephone conference call so that they were all uh, simultaneously talking and then we had this projected um, I don't know, probably a Mac uh, onto the wall with the speakerphone and what would happen is one person would bring up a whiteboard or they'd open up a color image and then someone else would draw a line across it and then up would come a sort of a contour map across that line of the image and, and they were all in this conversation. And from where you were sitting in the room, it was all coming from this one speaker and one screen because everything was melded together. And all of a sudden, everybody got it. In cyberspace, distance doesn't exist. Everybody is in one point. And it was a whole psychological transformation that came about from from that de demo. Well, one of the things that we had to do as we were developing Collage was not just be able to bring in remote computers, which Telnet let us do, or people, which the Collage synchronicity allowed us to do, but also documents. So um, we set up a team to go after what would be the right um, document retrieval uh, mechanism. And Dave Thompson, who was another one of our uh, undergraduate, um, computer science undergraduate guys, he um, found this thing called the World Wide Web. And that seemed pretty cool because it was not just documents, but it was hyper documents. Um, and so we put a team developing um, a module to go into collage, which became the Unix version of Mosaic, uh, Mark Andreessen, Eric Bina were the two Unix developers and then we gradually developed Mac and, and um, uh, Windows versions. By then DOS had gone to Windows. Uh, but again what this was is client multi-server and it got to pick up so much momentum of its own that it, it sort of got dislodged from collage and just became its own thing. And NCSA Mosaic um, at the time it started, maybe there were, I don't know, maybe a hundred web servers in the world, something like that. Um, we also, at that time, developed uh, the NCSA web um, server software, which until recently was the most used server software. And um, so again, we put it up on the Namas FTP, let people bring it down, did the rapid prototyping. And before there was any um, commercialization of it, uh, there was several million people around the world using Mosaic. And what it did is it set off a nonlinear growth curve that's continued to this day. Once you had an easy to use point and click interface to the World Wide Web, then people started looking at the servers. Until then it had been mainly geeks looking at geeks. Um, and when they saw how cool <laughs> stuff looked when it was put on the web, people said, well, I have cooler stuff than that. I want people to see me. And so they got their copy of NCSA 
uh, web server, HTTPD, and put it up their own web server and, and started putting their own stuff up. But then there was more stuff to look at, and therefore there was more reason to download the viewer. <laughs> and, and so it just got into this bootstrap. It was, in the end, all driven by nar narcissism. I mean, it's basically people wanted to put their own stuff out that people could see who they were. It was a very strange effect. And then gradually, um, without going into the details, roughly speaking, a lot of the Mosaic programmers went off and joined Mark Andreessen and Jim Clark and formed Netscape. Microsoft licensed, as did a hundred other companies, uh, the rights to use various things about Mosaic, and that led to the Internet Explorer and the two dominant uh, browsers uh, in the business.